The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Get started. Thank you for coming today. Um, we have a, a we're very privileged to have Dr. Romani Ochin from uh, Westmont College, Santa Barbara. That's Santa yes. Um, he is a rhetorician and a, uh, and a rhetorical philosopher as well, communication philosopher. So um, today he's going to be talk to you, talking with you about uh, his title talk, uh, his talk is Chronotopia, but he's looking at um, <coughs> ways of viewing social justice movements in Africa. And so I'm really excited that we have him here. Um, he's an excellent speaker and I'm sure you'll enjoy his conversation. Thank you. Good morning. I'm really grateful for uh, this invitation here to the Communication and English Department and to all of you who are here. Um, and thanks, thanks for being here. In my lecture today, I'd like to start a conversation with you on how best to think about social change and what the ultimate means of social change should be, right? What the ultimate um, goal of social change ought to be. Specifically, I'd like to argue that social change involves cultivating a radical, comprehensive, nuanced and multidimensional multi imagination about what ultimately makes for a good society. I'm calling that form of radical imagination chronotopian. And I'm using that term chronotopian to contrast it with two other ways of thinking about social change, the utopian and the anti-utopian. Now, as you probably know, the, anti -ut the utopian is, uh, refers to attempts to have a radical comprehensive change to bring about entirely new societies. Anti-utopianism is sort of the obverse of utopianism. It's, it's practices that stand against any comprehensive vision of the good society. I want to argue against anti-utopianism and utopianism and uh, sort of argue instead for chronotopianism. And I'll explain in a little bit what those terms mean. Now, if you have been socialized in the United States, you, are, you likely are an anti-utopian. That's sort of the dominant sensibility in the United States. I'd like to begin by considering some arguments offered for anti-utopianism and why I think we ought to be critical of these arguments. First, anti-utopians have claimed that incremental steps is preferable to radical revolutions. Now, it would be foolish to rule out incremental steps on principle, but I think we need to subject that notion of incrementalism to some greater scrutiny. One problem with the idea of incremental steps is that many who advocate it have this assumption that history follows a teleological pattern with each new year better than previous years. Progress in this view is inevitable. This year we are more moral, more technologi technologically savvy, and more prosperous than last year. So in a sense, all we have to do is wait. Now, this view is simply, I think, not supported by the historical record. While perhaps it's true that we have, been, we have seen spectacular technological change, our belief that today we are more moral than previous generations is nothing but a distillation of what the great British historian E.P. Thompson called the condescension of prosperity. And some of you who read C.S. Lewis, you know that memorable phrase of his called the, he calls it chronological snobbery, right? The, the notion, I think, across the years, we've seen a lot of uh, many critics of this view. I think to a certain extent, one can make the argument that Martin Luther King's a uh, letter from a Birmingham jail is sort of a critique of that notion of teleological progress, the idea that every new year we're getting better and better. You know, 
Uh, now, it's now sometimes taken by even advocates for good social change. Sometimes you hear even in the news um, people who are advocating for good, good goals that I agree with, saying that we are on the side of history. I, I really don't think that um, that's supported by the historical record. Now, a distinct strain of incrementalism is now fashionable, known as uh, humanitarian humanitarianism. Indeed, the hegemony of incrementalism is now so complete that many now believe that the only way they can ethically engage other societies is through donations to humanitarian relief work and through internships at philanthropic organizations. The most practical thing to do in response to suffering, so goes the argument, is through random acts of kind kindness. And all the better if those random acts of kindness are tax deductible. Right? It's not difficult to see why many are attracted to humanitarianism. One major reason is because many see humanitarianism as apolitical, as forms of action that are motivated by pure altruism. But note that the very context for why we have come to think of humanitarianism as apolitical is in fact framed by very political choices. Consider that many have come to think of humanitarianism as apolitical because humanitarianism makes appeals in the name of emergency. We must act, and we must act right now, so humanitarians argue to prevent genocide or because of a natural disaster that is killing millions or to bring about regime change to free people from a tyrant. The problem, however, is that the emergencies we are asked to respond to have long histories, often histories that we helped create. The major failure, I think, of humanitarianism is that it frames emergencies episodically rather than historically and reinforces our ignorance about the structural and systemic causes from which human and natural disasters are emergent. Consider also that there are deep political and economic interests that are always served by drawing our attention to certain disasters while misinforming and disinforming us about others. Consider that almost all imperialist actions, including, say, the latest, the US invention of Iraq, were undertaken in the name of freedom, democracy, justice, and human rights. Humanitarianism is closely associated with racial and economic tropes about the salvational role of Westerners rescuing other societies. This, let, me, let me show up a, sort of a, an example of this to, 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 to like give some flesh and give some uh, illustration of what I'm talking about. Right? Let, me, let me try to do this. I, I am famously uh, technologically inept, but I'll try. Did I do it right? Oh, on. That's helpful. <laughs> OK. The picture that I want to show is um, a famous uh, sort of picture that was taken by the founders of an uh, organization that you may happen to know, right? The, the founders of Invisible Children that sort of whipped up a lot of publicity uh, some time ago over um, the, uh, so this is the picture of uh, the founders of Invisible Children. Invisible Children is an organization that sort of was making people aware of a war, the sort of war in northern Uganda, and they wanted the they, they wanted sort of people to intervene or 
uh, try to bring about either the arrest or, or death of a famous warlord known as Joseph Cohn. Uh, and so they post with these soldiers. And I mean, to me, this is a sort of perfect illustration of the arrogance of humanitarianism, right? It's sort of a play acting kind of um, persona or stance, you know? We're going there to save, save uh, the other, the other in this case being the African other, right? There are sort of racial tropes, I think, that are captured in this picture. You know, racial tropes that we do well to examine, to critique, right? I don't want to go too deeply into um, invisible children because I mean, I, it's certainly not the only humanitarian um, organization out there, and I, I don't want to make it about any of these people specifically. I could have chosen any other. I could have chosen, for instance, uh, you know, there's one in Afghanistan that was asking people to buy shoes and so on. There are several, but my point is that there's a a sort of a, a long-running theme or undercurrent of salvi sort of salvational, the salvational role of Westerners in other countries. Humanitarian imperialism is closely intertwined with what I would call humanitarian capitalism, the orientation of activism around consumer choices that, you know, all we have to do right now is buy free trade coffee or buy shoes in order to uh, bring about change. Again, I will not want to be dismissive of any such efforts except to argue that in context, in context they fall far short of what, what really is required, which is a more radical uh, engagement with some of the structural historical issues. Lastly, humanitarianism has come to see, seem to us as apolitical because many see as more realistic, because many see it as more realistic. In part, this realism rests on the notion that we can all agree that all people ought to have basic necessities. I'm not sure we all agree, okay? And again, I shouldn't have turned that off. Let me again show. Um, Another picture here, just very briefly, then I'll stop. Is it true that we all agree that the abjectly poor should have basic necessities? I'm not sure that's the truth, okay? Um, in part, the idea that we all agree that everybody ought to have uh, basic necessities is motivated or is at least supported by the idea that uh, you know these are far off places and we should help them right but you know poverty you don't have to go to Africa to find poverty right you can find poverty in the United States and lots of it in the United States this picture here for instance is illustrative of um, it's illustrative of what I want to talk about you know this picture is actually one that was taken at, in LA. This is LA, and this, this, the students of USC Dental and Medical College decided to um, have a free day of dental care and health, health examination. No. And it was interesting that the line, those almost a 5,000 to 10,000 10, line of, or queue of people lining up for, for examination and for free dental care right here in the United States. Uh, now, if we all agreed that 
the abjectly poor ought to have basic necessities. necessities. This would not have been a controversy. This would not. First of all, we would think that everyone ought to have those basic necessities, and we don't have to have a free health day for 10,000 people to line up for uh, for examination. Some of them for examination of you know things like breast cancer. Many of them are coming, and they say they have a lump in their breast, and they would like that examined because they are afraid, and this this shooting pain all over them, right? For some of them, it's you know cavities that are extremely painful and infected, you know. But interesting, there was there was, uh, there was controversy, you know, because many for some people, the abjectly poor are lazy, and so we should not help them, right? For some of them, there uh, there are some people who are undeserving because they are not legal immigrants, and so we should not. They are sort of to them we are sapping. We are sapping the, our benefits. We are giving away our benefits to them, and so they should not be helped. My point is that we don't all agree that basic necessities should be taken care of. And that if you are interested in social change of some kind, you really have to start thinking about uh, social movements, being part of a social movement. right? And we can come to a discussion of that later. Now, if I'm critical the, of anti-utopianism, I that does not mean that I am a sort of full-throated advocate of utopianism. Utopianism is rife with difficulties of its own, and I can't, go to all, I can't go into all the difficulties of it, but I can mention a few. The first has to do with the epistemological presuppositions of utopianism. There are variants notwithstanding. Utopian ideologies have begun theorizing from a vantage point that assumes what some have called a commanding point of view. This element is strikingly exemplified in what James C. Scott, in his highly acclaimed book, uh, Seeing Like a State, described as high modernist ideologies. These ideologies posit society as a cadastral map or architectural model. The epistemological emphasis rests on sight or vision, and the characterization of the coming society emphasizes geometrical order and harmony. If, on the one hand, the commanding point of view offers a thin account of actually existing history, its predisposition lies toward fetishizing the program for social change. It insists that the details of the coming society are just so and not any other way. So here I invite you to think of many of the examples of utopian projects, some of which are documented in Scott's book, Seeing Like a State. For example, compulsory villagization in Tanzania, or the planning of Brasilia, or high modernist agronomics and forestation in, in Germany. Another problem with utopian narratives is that they tend to demarcate the new society as existing within a transcendent space, which seemingly operates as if either one, other societies do not exist, or if the borders of the utopia are inviolable. This may be because the new society is seen in resolutely special terms as a well-ordered society. Classic accounts of utopia portray them as islands, enclaves or colonies, delimited spaces, either segregated within the world or projected beyond it. Think, for instance, for some of you who read Thomas More's Utopia, for instance, which is set in the new world in an island, right? And you can think of many of the fictional, I don't know if you are interested in science fiction, but think about even how uh, sort of the utopian elements of science fiction and how they construct that new world, right? Conservative and classically republican accounts of utopia have tended to portray this delimited space as a pastoral paradise, while early to mid 20th century modernisms had great hopes that the future of utopia lay in rigorously planned cities. Okay? But whether liberal or conservative, utopians have tended to subordinate history to space when not suspending history altogether. 
Now, utopianism can take two seemingly contradictory dimensions. The first is the belief that the utopian society will inaugurate an absolute transmogrification of society and subjectivities. The creation not just of new societies, but of new people, right? A new being. And the new society is seen as a blank slate. And the subjectivities within that new society are completely made over, transfigured into new, new beings. Now, that's problematic. But if that's one side of the problematic of utopianism, another is the fantasy that, uh, paradoxically, another side of utopia is the idea that uh, they're sometimes just simply extensions of this, the status quo. In other words, the problem with many a utopia is not that they differ too much from the status quo, but rather that they differ too little, right? You know, if you read some uh, 19th century utopian texts, you know, some, some of them like Charles Ryacroft's 19th century utopian novel, The Triumph of Woman, right? Which really is animated by the revolutionary ideal. Think about it. According to Ryacroft, what is really revolutionary is having one person per pew in church. That's what he really thought of as a revolutionary. In other words, the problem with Ryacroft is that uh, his, his utopia narrows the imagination rather than uh, actually expanding our imagination. Uh, another utopian text that was popular in the 19th century is uh, Lady Mary Fox's account of an expedition to the interior of New Holland, which argued that, you know, you know, a really utopian society would be one where we replaced picnics with buffets. The problem then is that utopian texts sometimes are actually problematic for precisely the other reason that we, we often deride them for. Right? For this reason and more, I'm critical of both utopianism and anti-utopianism. And I want to commend to you chronotopian, uh, chronotopia as a term and as a, a praxis. Now, this chronotopia, therefore, are movements or political praxis that is radical and therefore critical of anti-utopianism. But because it's not animated by the vision of an absolute break with history and structure, it's critical of dominant utopian programs. Chronotopia simply means that the fight for a better society learns from history and does not indulge the fantasy of a clean slate. We begin where we are. We know that while we fight for the better society, it will always remain flawed and it will never ever be far perfect. Nevertheless, even starting from such an, an ideal horizon, we can still bring about some radical changes. Okay? I'm also using the term utopia as a, still move, as a, a, a modification of Mikhail Bakhtin's notion of chronotop. Bakhtin wanted us to start thinking of texts as interanimated by history and space. In other words, you know, when you're thinking, for instance, about in a chronotopian way, you never think that your moral horizons are bounded by your country. You're always thinking in terms of to what extent are the clothes I'm, I'm putting on dependent on somebody else's labor. And sometimes that labor is elsewhere in a sweatshirt. To what extent is my lifestyle, the SUV that I'm driving, dependent not only on subsidies, subsidies that are very much uh, a matter of privilege, right? but are also dependent on my country invading another country to exploit resources. In other words, when we think, we begin to think chronotopianly, we're thinking to what extent is history, to what extent is this current history that we have here very much made by others, some of them dead in other generations, some of them continuing to have um, very miserable lives on account of our desire for a comfortable life. Okay. I think radical social movements in Africa provide us with brilliant examples of the chronotopian. And I want to provide at least two examples of such movements. The first that I, I want to talk about is African feminist movements and African environmental movements. And I could also have talked about other movements, such as African LGBTQ movements, right, that have that continued to struggle against um, horrific persecution and horrific exclusion. 
Now, let's talk about um, African feminist movements, for instance, and some of the interesting things that they say about social change. African, social, African feminist movements have tried to argue against the idea that, um, against both conservative accounts and liberal accounts for, for very specific reasons. They have pointed out that, that the claim that African societies uniformly subordinated women throughout African history is simply not true. Nkiru Nzegu, for instance, has argued that we need to look at pre-colonial Igbo society, which had a thoroughly egalitarian system, at least in regard to the biological sexes. The Igbo system was rooted in actual institutional power for women such as the Omu and the Omuara that had juridical power. Women had a robust political participation. They reveled in their economic independence and they had a strong autonomy over their sexuality. Moreover, Nzegu argues, unlike in North Atlantic societies in which the idealized unit is the nuclear family with a patriarch as its head, in Iboland, a variety of family systems proliferated. The consanguineal family systems of the Igbo made the notion of patriarchy unintelligible. Some women in these polyphonic families were in, involved in what she calls Idigbe unions. In these kinds of unions, in these kind of relationships, a woman will choose a lover to have children with, but will, not, will stop short of marrying the lover. She thereby ensured that the children will become members of her lineage. Igbo societies also encouraged woman to woman marriages. As Nzegu points out, the role of a wife was not the focal point of a woman's identity, the identity in Igbo societies. Now, the African social feminist movements are making a certain point, a point that I hope is not lost, even if we disagree with the specific programs. Their point is that there are multiple ways of thinking about the family, and there are radically, radical ways of uh, reconfiguring the notion of family, rethinking the notion of family. And notice how this changes our conception of politics, right? We sometimes think that politics takes place out there in the public sphere. They want us to think of politics in the intimate sphere, in the domestic sphere, because they know that there's something called the private life or power where actual politics is carried out. African feministists such as Nzegu and others, are therefore intent on critiquing the flattening of African cultures by both conservatives and liberals. Instead, they point to its forgotten diversity. But their focus is not nostalgia. It's not the notion. It's the notion that while the sediment of history exerts a, high, a, a heavy force on the present, it also offers uh, fragments that can be rearticulated on behalf of freedom. But here's the thing. Chronotopian African feminist movements go beyond the demands for gender egalitarianism. That's an important point. Their genealogical claim is not simply that we have evidence, and they provide lots of evidence that we have worlds where gender hierarchies were not enacted, but rather that a critical African history reveals worlds in which gender was not the pivot for the distribution of power. The upshot is that their normative demand is for a radical transformation of subjectivity from the modern system in which gender is naturalized to one where gender counts as about as significant as, say, the size of a person's ears. Right? To them, the idea that we can actually abolish gender disti distinctions or abolish in the sense of, uh, in a very specific sense, right? Gender will matter just as much as the color of your eyes would matter, or the parting of your hair would matter. Now, they insist that this is not to be done by wishing away existing power differences, and so their program is very far from calling for gender blindness. Is that me? Sorry. I hope my cell phone is... They insist that this is not to be done by wishing away existing power differences. And so their program is very far from calling for gender blindness or color blindness, right, as the prerequisite of justice. Rather, what they are insisting upon is that the deconstruction of gender follows, it doesn't precede, but it follows the radical redistribution of power. 
And so they are really interested in this radical distribution that will render gender differences insignificant and and uh, problematic. And they point to actual examples of actual societies where this was possible. Uh, my, you know, they go by the no means and others are by no means nostalgic about this time. You know, they, they, they can point to other hierarchies that did exist, right? But they argue that insofar as we now have come to think of gender as a very naturalized thing, uh, it's possible to, to rethink gender. Another radical African social movement came from African environmental groups. The context for African ecopolitics is worth mentioning, and I'll just mention this in very broad strokes. There are at least two powerful discourses that African environmental movements have had to mobilize against. The first is the idea of Africa as a state of nature, an Edenic paradise of open spaces, wildlife, and primitive people. In places like Kenya, the face of conserva conservationism was often made out by the media to be that of white people, right? Uh, so these are mainly, not, not all, but certainly mainly British Kenyans, right? Rather than the f that, that of blacks. Indeed, one of the paradoxes of environmental conservation in Africa is how its ultimate justification is that it helps bring in European and American tourism the second discourse that African environmental social movements had to confront is the ideology of de developmentalism. According to this discourse, if Africans are to move into modernity, they ought to brandish the signs of development, such as having cities filled with skyscrapers, building big dams for hydroelectrical power, building highways and airports. As you can see, these discourses conflict. The discourse of North Atlantic conservationism demands open spaces for wildlife and calls for the preservation of African cultures for the sake of tourists to look at. But tourism at the same time demands that African cities be equipped with the accoutrements of modernity. Hence a peculiar contradictory discourse reigns in North Atlantic environmentalism which demonizes African cities as, um, which demonizes African cities as destructive of nature, insofar as they encroach on wildlife preserves, while at the same time demanding that African cities be developed and planned to modernist specifications. When Africans are not being ogled then at, by tourists, they're being cast as blithely destructive of the environment, or as inauthentic European and American wannabes. It's in this bleak context that one of the most momentous ecopolitical interventions emerged in the intellectual and activist work of Wangari Madhai and her Green Belt movement. Alarmed by increasing deforestation and desertification that she witnessed in the forests of her childhood, Madhai started the Green Belt movement, an organization that sought to mobilize women across Kenya to start planting trees. The involvement of women was a breakthrough in feminist organizing in Kenya, whose colonial and post-colonial history excluded women from political participation. In time, the Green Belt Movement established various chapters to plant one tree for every person in the country. They were rallying people with the motto or the slogan, one person, one tree. Its agenda was robust and expansive. It not only sought to bring about environmental consciousness, but also sought to raise the consciousness consciousness of women to their rights, to oppose the government's expropriation of public land, particularly forests and public parks in cities, and it opposed the illicit sale of, uh, it also fought for the release of political prisoners. State reaction, of course, was ferocious. Kenya's ruling party, for instance, went into overdrive in, her, in their efforts to silence and even kill Mandai. I think Madai's ecopolitics offers salutary lessons for how to organize, how to engage in social change. And I want to highlight at least some, some points about her movement that to seem to be distinct. The first is her robust intersectional politics. She draws together with her movement commitments to feminism, environmental sustainability, and democratic governance, right? 
that we cannot look at any social change without engaging in a sort of multidimensional critique of the gender politics, the racial politics, the, the sort of ideological politics that's going on, the environmental politics that's going on. Second, as Rob Nixon has argued very persuasively, Madai's choice of tree planting, in addition to its substantive environmental impact, also had held rich symbolic resonances. In a context in which media coverage of Africa swivels only to the drumbeat of spectacle, tree planting is a brilliant response to what Nixon called slow violence. Nixon has this word because he means by it catastrophic acts that are low in instant spectacle but high in long-term effects. Think, for instance, of our continued participation in climate change, the destruction of the environment that has a very slow effect that probably will uh, not be as visible to us as it will be to, previous, to, to, to generations that are going to come after us, right? When they have their cities flooded with water. Uh, so Nixon calls this slow violence. And Madai was particularly, uh, Madai's movement was particularly um, interested in highlighting these kinds of slow violences, you know, violences that have this in very imperceptible effect on us and will really, really come uh, to hit coming generations. Now, those kinds of imperceptible effects are not captured by our media and their, and their emphasis on spectacle, right? And so there's a question there for all sort of scholars of rhetorical texts, communication texts, and so on, who want to find out how best to capture, to represent slow violence, how best to capture things that cannot be captured by the media uh, as, as they are constituted at this moment, which focuses on, on spectacle. Third, Madai's movement shattered a long-standing colonial and post-colonial practice of pitting the city, pitting the city against the rural in Africa. Mahmoud Mamdani has argued that one of the most consequential legacies of colonialism was its establishment of what he he calls the bifurcated state. The colonial state and later post-colonial state established two vectors of governance. One law spoke the discourse of civil rights and civil society for urban dwellers, and the other law spoke the discourse of customary rights and culture, cultural traditions for rural inhabitants of Africa. The city was seen as the place to develop, and therefore developed by the enactment of concrete Right, the enactment of the accoutrements of modernity, while the rural was seen as natural and therefore seen as a jungle best left uh, for our eyes to feast on, the wildlife and the people. The, one of the sharpest battles that Madai, Madai fought was to refuse that binary distinction between the city. In a sense, by critiquing the idea of the natural, critiquing the idea that there's just this wilderness and nobody has ever touched that wilderness, by seeing how we have contributed to the making of the wilderness and that how best we can, we can uh, preserve that wilderness without romanticizing it, without having any nostalgia for, for it as somehow natural. At the same time with the city, refusing the idea of the city as just artificial. How, how do we design our cities? And what are the interests that go into the, the, the designing of cities? That's part of what she was going on about. The lesson of African social movements is to awaken our imaginations to thinking comprehensively about radical social change. Now, by imagination, I mean not only faculties that help us expand our sense of the possible, but also capac capacities that help us see familiar things anew. Right? So it's not only about coming up with radically innovative ideas, but thinking, how can we take a look at what we already know and see it anew? I'd like to think that the chronotopian imagination is the kind of imagination, imagination that a liberal arts university, such as this one, ought to cultivate. Because at its best, the kind of education that you're getting, or that the faculty are articulating here, transgresses boundaries. 
We learn, for instance, how literature and art and song and dance illuminate the natural world. We learn how the social sciences can offer insights on meaning and purpose. We experience how the natural sciences can stretch our sense of the possible and the impossible. I think this is our task, the task of us as scholars, activists, and global citizens to reanimate our commitment to education with a project for a global social justice. Thank you. I'd be interested in questions or thoughts that you have. Certainly, I'd be interested in critique. You know, I teach argumentation and I love debate. Yeah. Uh, uh, that you talked about um, the idea that every, everybody believes that all people should have the base needs. Mm -hmm. And you were critiquing that, saying that maybe that's not possibly true. Um, I was wondering if maybe people do believe that all people should have those basic needs, but where we differ is how to get them those basic needs, mm -hmm. and more importantly, who's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So even, even people who say are like, like you said, uh, well, not the immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants, because they're drawing on our taxes for the people that are citizens of this country, or not those people way over there because they don't affect us, and all this other stuff. Whereas they, they feel like, okay, well, they need those things, but it's not our responsibility to get it for them. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, you know, as taxpayers, we don't want to pay taxes for people that aren't paying taxes to help. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, illegal immigrants work, they make money, but they don't pay taxes to the country, so they're not paying for themselves. Why should we pay for them? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I'm not saying that this is necessarily right or wrong, but what I'm saying is it's not that necessarily that they don't believe that these people don't deserve these things. It's Who's responsible for providing? Yeah, yeah. That's where I think the, the difference occurs. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, and I think certainly that's the way that uh, many, I mean, a significant number of our population see see the point. Um, I suppose I would just say that uh, to all sometimes. Uh, one of the things I was trying to emphasize is the idea of us as embodied people and as uh, having histories and engaged in and uh, being part of certain institutions, actual institutions. And so it's very small comfort if somebody tells me that um, I don't want, I don't disagree with you. Um, I mean, I don't mind if you, I mean, I, I would want you to have food, for instance, but um, here I am starving, and um, it's just not my responsibility to give you that food. I suppose if you look at me, that's not problematic, but I'm thinking of young children, for instance, right? Um, or people who are in desperate need of emergency care, health care. Um, for them to be told, well, we, we don't mind if you have those things, but it's just not our responsibility. It's the effect or the actual situation is no different from if I just walked by. To what extent are we then in that situation of people who are saying to solve our conscience, I would like to, I don't, I, I would want everyone to have basic necessities, but it's just not me who's supposed to offer that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I certainly think that that's a, a good point. But I'd like to hear other people's thoughts on, on that, if there are any responses. There's belief, right? And then there's a conviction to that. Belief, yeah, right? and, yeah. And, and what I hear from you is an argument that puts those two together, right? That, that a belief really is maybe a belief unless you also have a, a conviction to making that belief a priority for you. Right, because you know I might believe in the tooth fairy, right? But you know I'm not, you know, I'm not willing to, you know, knock out a tooth to find out if that's true, right? I mean, there's, there's, I mean, in terms of actions, right? I mean, I'm willing to support it. I might believe yeah. that people should have food, but you know, I believe that I like my TV better. Yeah. Right, um, and so that, uh, and so then it becomes an issue of conviction and choice yeah. that gets attached to that. I think it's convenient. 
Yeah, yeah. We like convenient beliefs, I guess is what I would say. Right, that, right. You know, I, I enjoy having the convenient belief that everybody should be treated equally, but if you ask me to give up some of my privilege, that's a different story. Right. right? And that's a choice, right? right. I mean, so I think there's, I, I mean, I would draw some distinction between. Yeah, yeah, the, the philosopher Tama Jenla coined the term Alif, right? A-L-I-E-F. To talk about, um, you know, that there are a lot of things that it's interesting that when these psychological studies were done uh, of people, they were, so for instance, told to, I don't know if any of you have ever walked on the, there's some place in Grand Canyon where apparently you can walk over it, some glass, you know what I'm talking about, some glass walkway, okay? And many people cannot go across that glass walkway, even though they know this is perfectly safe, right? Uh, and uh, other studies were done where, you know, great food, very good food was served um, on very clean, sterilized bed pans, right? <laughs> you know, and nobody would eat it. In other words, her point was that, you know, we need a term for uh, things that we believe. We can know that something is true, like we believe in it, but for all intents and purposes, that's not the way we act. That's not how we respond, right? Uh, and one of the things I, I did in, in a paper that I'm writing in conjunction with this was that this makes us change our previous ideas about what ideology is, you know. There was uh, this belief at one time that people don't do what they ought to do because they are having false consciousness. In other words, somebody has come and taught them something that is wrong or false, right? And that's not really, that's just, a, uh, false consciousness doesn't capture the many ways that people behave, even though many people believe, for instance, that we should give food to the poor or we should help out in a certain situation, the way that they live their lives is not reflective at all of, you know, many of us, for instance, we know very well that, you know, politician X, you know, loves to kill people, whatever. But our life doesn't reflect that, you know, we continue to vote for politician X, we continue to support them. So in other words, there's sort of a distinction there between belief and belief. Other thoughts on this specifically and on anything else? So one thing that I found interesting was for the African feminist movement, you have this kind of almost convenient like, history, right? It provides you a model that would be deconstructive of current gender relations. Right? So mm -hmm. assuming that your movement doesn't have a history that produces something that's helpfully radical, right? Yeah. And so then I think of the environmental movement. In this case, it sounds like the burden on a chronotopic movement to be successful is to generate a kind of almost like perfect rhetorical symbolism, like planting a tree, yeah. that deconstructs while not calling forth utopianism. Right? Yeah. And um, it's sort of a conclusion we ended up with in my last time we talked about social movements in rhetoric class is the, the burden of creating this particular kind of symbolism. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you'd agree with that, that that's, that's a part of, or if your interpretation of those movements would be different than that. I would agree completely. I think part of it is to articulate a good symbol, a, a symbol that is resonant for many people, that is powerful enough to evoke uh, a shared meaning, and that is radical enough, also substant substantively, right? So the planting of trees, it's a symbol, but it's also, in a sense, having an impact on the environment, a an actual impact on the environment. But that's very hard, and many people have argued that, you know, one of the things about the Green Belt movement was that, uh, one of the things I think for social movements in general is the question of appropriation, you know? You can establish a certain symbol and it's, it's all too easy to appropriate it, you know, make it. So, you know, maybe a company can come along and say, you know, we are part of the Green Belt movement, plant a tree, you know, which, you know, it's not a problem for me per se that a company will sponsor it, but in the larger context, we know that corporations are, you know, involved in some of the worst environmental um, 
destruction out there. So how do you then articulate symbols and fight against appropriation and also fight for symbols that are widely resonant across many societies and many people? It's a, it's a hard question and it's certainly not just something that you can solve, it's something you fight for every day. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like if I plant a tree, I don't need somebody from the United States to come and protect that tree from me. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's all these sort of things that happen as a result of that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Other thoughts? I don't know. You must have been involved in Invisible Children or know about it or felt like you had to contribute. I see you nodding. Were you? <laughs> You are aware at least of the publicity campaign, right? Well, um, I can't remember. I know I was quite a bit younger when the Visible Children actually first um, came out. And wow. I remember they did like a, a, a night protest mm -hmm. where, you know, high schoolers from all over the nation would come out to their um, like football field and bring sleeping bags. And it was like this silent protest um, and in a way that they felt like they were contributing to the cause, you know, in Africa. And I just remember being so moved and so touched by that. And of course, I didn't participate, but I really found it, you know, um, powerful that so many people could be reached like that, yeah, you know? Yeah, and yeah. it's all over our church youth group and various youth groups around the area. And um, then as years went by, you know, it kind of faded out and then just exploded with this Joseph Coney thing, mm. you know? And I just, at first, you know, I was kind of like, wow, here it comes again, you know, but then I felt like it was really exploited, you know, and it was used for the wrong reasons and the wrong purposes. And of course, conspiracies arise in a, in a variety of situations, but um, so many things were going around where, you know, Joseph Coney wasn't even a threat at the time. And, but because I wasn't well versed on the, you know, current mm -hmm. social issues that were going on over there, yeah. you know, I didn't really know what was truth or reality. And I think so many people, you know, blindly follow these rapid, huge social movement, mm -hmm. not really being educated enough or knowing exactly what's going on. Right, right, and right. And I think it's more so for self-satisfaction mm -hmm. than it is for the greater cause and the greater good. Yeah, yeah. Good point, yeah. You mentioned two things there that I want to pick up on. One is, um, to what extent are our, you know, sometimes we focus so much on making people aware, you know? What's the assumption of making people aware? You know, you have the knowledge, right? After the knowledge, <laughs> what? You know, I mean, there are lots of organizations that are solely for the purpose of collecting money. I'm thinking of, you know, wearing wristbands for, you know, cancer. Or, you know, it's for solely for the purpose of making people aware. You know, and then knowledge. Sometimes we have this sort of platonic notion that, you know, if you know, then you do the right thing, right? <laughs> uh, lots of us don't do the right thing even when we know what the right thing is. Okay. Right. And, and, and letting people think in that more than 4 million healthy cats and dogs are, are euthanized or killed every year in shelters in the United States, which is actually down from 17 million 20 years ago, mm -hmm. changes. They don't know. Yeah. And then they think, wow, I had no idea there was a problem. Yeah. And then they may not join me yeah. in the rescue organization. But they don't think I'm weird anymore. So, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I think that that can help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly think that you're right. That there's, you know, you don't want to go the other way and say, you know, we ought to be ignorant. Uh, you more <laughs> No. It's hard to, to uh, adopt that posture uh, specifically. Right. Even if you're not really a big cat or dog lover, it's yeah. really hard for you to say, well, yeah, I think it's good that we kill mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps the lesson there is that, you know, along with awareness, there has to be other institutional, structural things going on. You know, people like you, activists, you know, actual structural questions that, you know, can bring people who 
mistreat or maltreat animals or you know things like so we need we need sort of a, a larger structural um, awareness on its own is probably not that helpful. Yeah, yeah. And it can be illusory, right? You think, oh I'm aware of it and therefore that's it. And I accept it. Yeah, yeah. You need education Simple things. Keep it simple at first because most people aren't going to go fly over to, to Africa or go, you know, do major radical things. They're going to say, well, you know, like with recycling, one of the things is like, okay, just throw your bottles in a different can, right? And things of that nature. So, but, you know, make people aware, um, educate people on what they can do to change it, and then provide people with easy opportunities to make those changes. Right, right. And then, and the people that can do things, the more radical things, we can provide opportunities for them as well. Mm -hmm. Good points, yeah. Good points. Yeah. I think, like, you know, personally, in my experiences, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've just kind of started to become more aware that, you know, socially, and I hate to make such a generality, but there's a lot of trust issues mm -hmm. that exist um, between mm -hmm. the people and organizations, mm -hmm. uh, like misappropriation of funds, yeah, and all those yeah. things. Um, and so it gets to a point where, you know, your heart might be in the right place, but how do you trust that this organization is and that the funds are being, you know, appropriated in the direct uh, way that they say that they are? You know, um, and it reminds me of uh, when I like to uh, give to, I used to give to my church or give to various mm -hmm. different missions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I got to the point where I, you know, started researching and getting deeper and deeper into, yeah. you know, where those funds are being allocated. and. It came to a point where the only mission that I truly believed the funds were being appropriated in the right way mm -hmm. was with somebody I personally knew. Yeah. And that I personally could watch the work that was being done in Singapore, you know, or Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And so I felt comfortable giving in that way. But how many people don't have that outlet or that connection personally where you can trust where the funds are going or where your contribution is really being allocated? And I think mm -hmm. that you know, that's one of the biggest issues. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I agree completely. And certainly my critique is not a sort of wholesale critique of all humanitarian organizations. There are lots of humanitarian organizations that are doing excellent work. And part of the problem with Invisible Children, for instance, is we dis it's almost like, oh yeah, you just discovered this. There are lots of organizations that have been having ongoing work across decades, you know. They were just not getting on CNN. You know, so the, the question then for us is then how can we uh, research the organization in such a way that we find out things about and how much overhead are they spending, you know, how much are they paying the CEOs, I mean things like that. Um, what are actual on the ground assessments of what they're doing? I know it's hard work, but it's, it's, it's what's called for, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs> I appreciated this talk. Yeah. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.